Hello students and welcome to yet another session of communication law, ethics and diversity. The last time we met, I discussed the topic of those particular types of speeches that are not protected under the constitution. And those were some speeches that included fighting words and things that relied around the laws of defamation. Today, we're going to be talking about some journalistic privileges and those particular issues around freedom of information and of course the Freedom of Information Act. Now, what is and what should not be in the context of access, journalistic privileges, the Freedom of Information Act, and of course, open records. Now, access in the context of, of the First Amendment, it has to do with freedom of the press and other laws in the United States, which in fact do not give journalists greater access or immunity. It may surprise you that notwithstanding the First Amendment and the freedoms under the First Amendment, the freedom of the press is not necessarily a remit, or should I say a preserve of every single journalist when it comes to where they can and cannot go and the types of issues that they can actually report on in the context of that particular issue. Now, I'd like you to seek City of Oak versus King 1989 for a particular case that is aligned to my particular assertion here in the context of the rights and privileges of journalists with respect to their access or immunity. Now, the King case. A King, a journalist working with WTMV or WTMJTV Milwaukee, what he did, he jumped a roadblock set up by Oak Creek Police to gain access to the site of a plane crash at a local airport. Now you would see here in the image, a picture there of, you know, the late Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna. And we know that in the particular case that his wife brought against the sheriff, um, you know, office, she won the case. It was a case where they got on the side, they got there as the persons who would, um, you know, be assigned to take crash scenes and sites and the remains. And of course, when they got there, they took the liberty of sharing um, and causing those pictures to go viral. And of course, it traumatized, um, you know, Vanessa and the rest of the family and stuff like that. So what King did, you know, working with this TV station, perhaps he would have gained notoriety from gaining access to other places. So WTMJ, or I would say the TV station in Milwaukee, you know, they expected him to come back with the story. So he decided that he wanted access to the plane crash site at a local airport. And as he started to shoot his photographs, the police officer caught up and said, you know what, you need to leave the area. And what did he do? He refused. And he said that he's only going to leave if he was arrested. He was arrested, of course, and charged with trespassing. Now, like I said in the beginning, not every single space that is a public place, a journalist has a right to actually be there. So there are some places that they cannot go because they'll be cited with trespassing because it's an active site of investigation. If it's a plane crash, if it's a real terrible accident, it is an active scene of investigation that they've got to cordon off and they've got to make sure that they, you know, they, they keep the area untampered with or on encumbered or untouched so that everything that the investigators need to find out, they will find them there to be able to piece the particular case together. So when he refused, he was charged with trespassing and he took the matter to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, but he lost the case because what he was, King was in contravention of the regulations governing the rights and access and privilege of journalists to be in certain spaces to cover their story. He was in effect in contravention of the First Amendment. So not because the reporter has the right to report and has access to information and the right to divulge the access. He doesn't have access to every single space or he or she or that person doesn't have access when it comes to covering certain types of stories. So the Supreme Court was within their rights to actually throw the case against King because King had no right actually trespassing on the scene of the accident. Now you would recall in terms of First Amendment access that public forums like roads should remain open and the government cannot restrict access to them or impose content-based restriction. But I did say, and you would recall that the government can impose restriction if it has a compelling interest. If it's a site that has to do with prison breaking or fire, you cannot be there. And I did say that an airport cannot be a place where the public or journalists can actually have on, you know, you know, unfettered access. And then they can say, well, we're first to be there and we need to be able to tell the story. 
government can say, you know what, you cannot be in these particular places at this time because this is an active site, all right? The argument here on the Oak Creek situation is that the roadblock was set up to prevent people from crowding the scene to allow easier access to emergency vehicles and personnel. Can you imagine the confusion if you have 10 journalists from distinct media houses descending on the scene of the accident as it occurred within a couple of seconds, and then the ambulance is there to try to save those persons who are victims, who are actually um, you know, survivors of that particular crash or accident, and the ambulance is unable to get in there to save those people who are on their last because the reporters are actually there and they're encumbering, all right? So it's a situation where there's an interest here because if you're crowding the scene or if you're deemed to be enc encumbering, then it's a situation where there's a compelling interest um, in, the con in the context of access and journalistic privileges. So I hope that you're very clear on this particular argument here. In the case of uh, this reporter, the reason why he was cited for trespassing, it's as a result of this particular concern that has to do with public forums where the First Amendment is concerned. So government can actually impose restrictions if it has a compelling interest. And an accident is enough or sufficient to be deemed a compelling interest so that journalists do not have access to actually encumber. Now, airports are considered non-public forums. You would recall me talking about this when I spoke about the First Amendment and where we can and cannot go on the rights and stuff like that. And when I spoke about the public forum doctrine, the government can impose any restriction, both content-based and content neutral, because no one is supposed to be there in terms of an actual airport. I'm not talking about a crash site for an accident, but an actual airport, all right? So our government buildings and offices where government is actually conducting business. Um, the question is, is there a conflict between access and accountability? There should not be. The government in the Sunshine Act, also known as Federal Open Meetings Law of 1979, uh, they stated that the public, not exclusively the press, they have a right to attend meetings held at the federal agencies or commissions and boards with some independent authority whose board members are appointed by the president. So the public has a right to be at these meetings as a result of the federal open meetings law of 1979. What is not permitted, even though you have a right to be there, it's a couple of things. Number one, participation. Number two, recording of those meetings. Number three, broadcasting or photography photographing the meetings, you may not, you may actually obtain copies at a later time, but you may not take your cameras out. So you will see that if you're going into certain public spaces and meetings, they will say to you, come right in, have a seat. And you will see a sign that says, you know, photography is prohibited, broadcast is prohibited. These types of things, recording is prohibited. However, agencies have a right to exercise their own discretion. And so the Federal Communications Commission they actually allow audio recordings and non-flash photography in some instances. Um, like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they require prior permission to do so if you were to go into their meetings. You have to get permission to pull your camera out and to actually do any recording or photography in those particular settings under the Sunshine Act. Now, notice and complaints under the Sunshine Act, um, agencies have a right to, they must post their notices of their meetings at least a week in advance to give the public enough time to attend. If someone is denied entry, they can file a lawsuit within six days of the denial. And when it comes to exemptions under the Sunshine Act, there are a couple of things you need to note. Information relating to national defense, relative solely to internal personal rules and practices, matters specifically protected by law and trade secrets or privilege or confidential commercial information or matters censoring or accusing a person of a crime. These are the exemptions. So if it's of a national interest in the context of the nation's uh, security and safety, then <laughs> these are exemptions in terms of what they can and cannot, where, where, where a reporter can and cannot go in terms of um, their access to information and their reporting, all right? Um, some other exemptions where disclosure would constitute a breach of privacy related to investigatory records where the information would harm the proceedings, information for the use of an agency responsible for the regulation of situation or financial institutions, and we go right down to information relative to the agency's participation in legal proceedings. If it's an active case, then the reporter cannot and should not be allowed. Uh, they have a right to say to you, we um, 
at this time are sorry, we cannot divulge, all right? Because this is really inimical to our um, privacy and the legal proceedings here right now. So we would ask that you respect the closed meeting or anything that will lead to financial speculation or endanger the stability of a financial institution. So these are exemptions to the Sunshine Act to note. The federal open meetings law, on the other hand, only applies to federal agencies and not state agencies or local government meetings. So this means that each state, you will find they will apply their own Sunshine Act that governs their local meetings. This includes the state of Georgia, all right? For those of you who are not from the state of Georgia, you would know that in your own state, there are laws um, that are assigned or applied to the staging of local meetings. Now, the Georgia Open Meetings Act is what actually governs the staging of, the, or the hosting, so to speak, of meetings that involve the public. And so the public right to attend meetings really of the governing body of an agency and not all meetings held in the agency is what they apply to their laws. And so a meeting really speaks to gatherings of members to discuss or take legal action, take official action regarding the business or policy of the particular organization. I believe that this particular link, and the content, you can find this easily online if it's not already in D2L. Now, the Georgia Department of Transportation and Road Extension, under the Georgia Open Meetings Act, you will find that the Budget and Planning Committee is not the governing body. And of course, the meeting is not about discussing or taking action regarding official business or policy. In this case, you can actually be a part of this meeting if it's not about discussing or taking action regarding official business or policy, all right? Agencies must post notices, at least like I said, 24 hours before, no later than two weeks in advance. And of course, government meetings that are considered closed or non proper, um, you must have a written demand. And if refused, the, 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 the lawsuit must be filed before the meeting is actually scheduled, all right? So it means that whatever meetings are being held under the Georgia Open Meeting Act, the public must know by notice at least 24 hours before, not the, you know, the, the group or the agency decides on the same day, especially if they're making a decision that pertains to the public, on the same day that there's a meeting, and then you get wind of the meeting, you turn up and you lock out of the meeting, all right? If it's closed during improper, or if you consider it to be closed during improper, then you can do a written demand, and of course, you can file a lawsuit once you have sufficient evidence claiming or stating or purporting or supporting that you're purposely or willfully Lock out of that particular meeting because they're making decisions they don't necessarily want the public to be aware of that are inimical to the public interest. Again, as we move along, Georgia Open Meetings Act held behind closed doors improperly. You have 90 days to file against that particular group that has called that meeting. And of course, all the decisions and actions made in, the, in, in, in that particular meeting, it would be voided if you won that particular case. If you move to the court and the court rules in your favor, then whatever decisions are taken, like I said, if it's a decision that has to do with closing a road or cutting a budget that has to do with a community development, then whatever they've done behind closed doors without the benefit of the public, those particular decisions would be voided by the court. So violating the act really is a misdemeanor and it has a fine of up to $500. For exemptions, you can see this particular site in terms of the open meetings laws of Georgia. Now, let's go to the Freedom of Information Act. It's called FOIA, or FOIA of 1967. I just made that one up. But the Freedom of Information Act of 1967 actually lets anyone request records from federal agencies. This was an assignment that I gave to students formerly when I taught this course years ago. Well, it's not years ago, not very long ago, but a couple of years ago. What this act really does, it's a, it allows you to allow, it allows me to actually request a record and so I'm not giving you a, a freedom of information, <laughs> yeah, you know, records request assignment, but bear in mind that if you ever wanted to request records, it is really protected or it's enshrined in the Freedom of Information Act as your right, that act of 1967 for you to ask federal agencies to provide some response to your request. All right. Now, the public right to know the inner workings of the government institutions, uh, you know, that American taxpayers, you know, you know, their money goes in, you're, you, I'm a taxpayer, you're a taxpayer, it is within the constitution. Again, under that 1966, 1967, so to speak, um, act. 
facts, all right? Sometimes it happens before and then it's assented to, it becomes law um, when the president signs off. So you have a right to know, I have a right to know, and anyone can actually request records from federal agencies. But we're gonna talk about that which you cannot actually request. So what this act really did in 1967, it allowed journalists to that might otherwise be shut away forever. It was lifted with the Freedom of Information Act. However, a couple of conflicts will emerge from time to time where government business and private industry, there are going to be some intersecting interests or what we might call overlapping interests. And there may be instances where you might find it very, very difficult for the government to actually reveal <laughs> the information that you should have. And most of you are too young to know about what happened years ago in terms of the Watergate scandal and how that particular scandal was revealed and it helped to bring down a particular precedent um, in the context of the information that was revealed and the precarity of the situation at the time and who was implicated. And so in terms of the act, the reporter is the one in most instances who is going to make the request, send the request to the government agency. The government agency's point person does a review and of course, the Chief Freedom of Information Officer or that person gets back to the reporter who seeks that information or who makes the request. It doesn't mean free information. In some cases, you may have to pay as much as $25 to actually get the information. Um, if it's really exceeding $25, you may be notified, for it, but it may very well be based on what it is you're actually accessing or seeking to access. If it's pile upon pile of declassified information from since the 1980s or whatever period, you may have to pay as much as $100. It just depends on the nature of information and of course the volume that you're seeking to actually um, have access to. Now, there's, there are a couple of considerations to <laughs> when you're going to have your requests answered in terms of the Open Records Act. First of all, let's look at the commercial use requests. If you're seeking um, a request for commercial use from or on behalf of someone who's requesting information um, to further their trade or profit or interest, um, this is when you will actually state in your open records letter or your request that you're seeking to actually do so, all right? The agency, the receiving agency will actually assess the charges that we cover the full direct course of searching for this particular content. Um, and of course, duplicating the record that you're actually looking for. So in some cases, people may want, um, you know, some sort of hit single or something that was actually said or done years ago earlier. Um, it's in the archives. And so the person has to go dig very deeply. And so it may cause them time and effort. And of course, uh, duplicating on specific machinery and stuff like that. And so it may be sometime before the information gets back to you. But that goes into the particular requests because it's really for commercial purposes. And so a charge will be brought against the particular person in terms of costs. Then we have what is called the education or educational institution request. If you were to do one, I would say to you frame your particular request under this. This is a preschool or a public or private elementary or secondary school or institution, graduate or undergraduate. You're actually seeking the information for the advancement of scholarly research. In other words, you're seeking you know, information on what was actually there on the spot where Clayton State University is built right now. You're seeking information on who was the governor you know, back in the 1940s or 1950s. Maybe it's information that is not available on Google or on the search, right? So you're seeking all of these different bits and pieces of information because you're doing research, you're doing some sort of historical analysis of public institutions in the state of Georgia and you want to do a comparison between let's say Clayton State and Georgia State University or Clayton State and UGA or whatever university, but you want to have some information that is not readily available in the Clayton State archives, all right? So you're seeking that particular information for educational purposes to advance scholarly research. Um, so educational institution requests may come from the colleges or universities and the chairperson of the department, if one of you were to do that, particular request, you've got to have that request signed by whoever is chairing the department. If you're in visual and performing arts, then the chairperson would be Dr. Terence Johnson. If you're from another department, you've got to find out who your chairperson is. Um, and then of course they're signing off or they're supporting the request. And of course on the institution's behalf, 
and it will serve as supporting documentation. So it becomes a very seamless process for you if you were to do it in this particular context. Um, the agency will provide documents um, in the category, of course, the cost of reproduction, excluding charges for the first 100 pages. And of course, there's some details here that you can actually examine. Then there's some requests that are made for non-commercial or scientific purposes. Non-commercial or scientific purposes mean that you are using it for commercial purposes. And of course, for the purpose of conduct, conducting um, non-commercial rather, I, I beg your pardon, it has to do with what you're doing in the context of um, not a particular industry promotion or anything like that. So let me read that again. Non-commercial scientific institution means that the institution is not operated for profit, all right? It's basically for the purpose of conducting scientific research. So this can be a laboratory. It can be um, a particular research, research and development establishment. It can be a unit within the institution as well. And of course, similar reproductive charges, reproduction charges rather, will be applied to this particular request. So whether you're doing it for a class project or you're representing a scientific agency or research institution, this is really for non-commercial purposes that you're making that particular request. And it's pretty similar to the education institution request, except that this, these are entities that may be standing alone and not necessarily under um, the education institution. Now, you can also have requests coming from your news establishment. And so as a representative of the news media, you may request news for the entity that you're actually gathering the information from, whether it's broadcast or to publish. And of course, the definition here should be really about current events that would be of current interest to the public. So when you're framing the request, you're saying that you are collecting the data for news purposes in the interest of the public because you'd like to let the public know about the historical nature of X, Y, or Z, all right? You want the public to know what the stats and the figures are stating about a particular budgetary allocation. So depending on what it is you're doing in the context of the news, if you're running an investigative piece or whatever you're doing, you're stating that it's within the public interest, something that is happening right now, that's the reason why you're actually doing that particular, um, making that particular request. Now, representatives of the news media will include those who work in the internet, newspaper, magazine, you know, multimedia settings and stuff like that. And of course, news media will be a plethora of all of these different people. And they are in the context of those who are informed about what's happening because they're disseminating the news. So they have to inform themselves before they can actually inform their constituents, all right? They make their products available for purchase by the general public. So they may be deemed to be of a commercial interest as well, apart from being in the public interest when it comes to making their requests. So editors may pay a whole lot. They may pay a hefty sum for the information. In some cases, they may say, well, we don't wanna pay because we're producing a documentary that is a public broadcasting service to the people, or it may be for commercial purposes. So they may not have a problem with paying for the duplication. Now there's a fee waiver that can happen when it's in the public interest, you're likely to contribute significantly to the public understanding. Once you can prove that, then they may waive the fee, all right? Some established considerations may be the subject of the request. The subject has to be really concerning operations or activities of the government. Of course, the information value has to be disclosed. How is it likely to contribute to society's understanding of government's operations? They may waive the fee as well. How is it likely to really clarify or have the public understand in a general way what is happening in that particular context where that issue is concerned, or let's say the significance of public understanding where that issue is concerned in terms of its evolution, all right? So if it's going to contribute significantly to, to the public understanding, then the fee may be waived as well. If you're talking about economic policies of the six days and you're comparing it with what is happening in 2023, 2023, well, <laughs> the public needs to know how a recession takes place, what it looks like and stuff like that. If it's going to contribute to clarity, then we're going to reveal the information to you in terms of what happened and some of the major decisions that we took in meetings that are not necessarily known to the public. It may be a fee waiver. So under the amendments to the law in 2007, the request is to be assigned a tracking number to check the status. So if you were to make a request, then you should receive a tracking number that should say to you if you're a researcher, whether or not the information is going to be given to you on time for you to complete your study. If you're a reporter, 
you will know if the information is going to be given to you before you complete that investigative piece or if it's going to take an inordinate uh, you know, a, a amount of time for them to get back to you specifically. So the agency is obligated to respond to your written request within 20 working days, minus Saturday and Sunday now, 20 working days, but as a practical matter, agencies frequently discard, dis disregard that particular deadline without any penalty. So in other words, you can actually make a request today or let's say, you know, on the weekday, January 30th, and one month later, you're still waiting because they're not obligated to respond to you in the 20 days that is actually written there <laughs> under the amendments of the Freedom of Information Act and the laws regarding open records requests. And this was in 2007. We're now in 2023, and they're not in a hurry. All right. Under the fee waiver as well, the amendments offer the agencies a potential out in meeting that deadline by allowing them one clarification request. So you can make your request the 30th. And then of course they can say, well, we received your request, but we have clarifications that we need. And so they write you back and then they have another 30 days or 20 days added on. And so you can be waiting for an entire three months until you've gotten clarity, you know, until you've provided them with clarity. And of course, until they're very satisfied that they're clear about your request. And that is how some reporters wait very long, or that is how some people who do research wait very long before they can get the information they require to actually bring out their study or their particular piece. So a response basically is a request. And of course, it's, it's really in connection with a grant or a denial of the record sought. Sometimes just a simple acknowledgement by the agency is needed but this does not necessarily to be counted as the response which you are entitled under the Freedom of Information Act, all right? Should an agency fail to issue response in 20 days as is statutorily required, it may be allowed additional time without violating the law if there are unusual or exceptional circumstances. Now, what are these unusual or exceptional circumstances? A routine backlog, you know, there are quite a few persons, quite a few of your colleagues are requesting the same information. We've got to make sure we handle those. Or we've got a backlog of requests coming during the COVID pandemic. We've got to make sure we clear those that came in in 2021. Then we're going to look at your requests. You know, some of them are fulfilled in 20 days. You have your luck. In some cases, you're going to wait very long for that backlog to clear. Now, delays may be challenged and denials may be appealed in courts. Don't know how many of those particular court appeals have proven successful. It's something for us to research. But the burden of proof is usually on the government, meaning that the government agency has to prove that it had a legitimate reason for not responding within the 20 days or denying your request. So they may always say there's a backlog, all right? They have to prove that there's a backlog and they can probably do so by the log and presenting the logging code as the way in which they're trying to chip away at those particular requests that came in ahead of years. Court may take action against federal employees who acted improperly, and they can award attorney fees if they see or they deem the acts to be unconstitutional or to be purposeful in the context of not providing the response when the information was at the person's disposal, and they were definitely delaying without a cause. Which agencies are covered under the Freedom of Information Act? Every agency, every department, every regulatory commission a government control corporation and other establishment in the executive branch of the federal government. Cabinet offices are covered as well, departments of defense, state, treasury, department of interior justice, Bureau of Invest federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, or the Bureau of Prisons, all right? So it means that the GBI is also covered within this particular um, range here in terms of um, Freedom of Information Act. And independent regulatory agencies and commissions, these are as well are also um, covered. Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commission, and of course, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. They're all supposed to be covered, and they should, by right, based on the coverage here, provide the information that is actually requested. Government control corporations, such as the US Postal Service and Amtrak, presidential commissions, the Executive Office of the President, and the Office of Management and Budget, they're all covered, but not the president, his immediate staff, the office of the vice president or the office of administration, which advises the president, all right? So if the office is covered and the budget office is covered in management, 
not the president, what does that say to you? They don't necessarily need to divulge for the purpose of security and other clearances, all right? Now, which agencies are not covered apart from what I've just said out there to you? <laughs> the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the American Red Cross. They both receive federal funds, but they're not controlled by the federal government. So it means that they don't necessarily have to reveal information to you, all right? Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the American Red Cross. Not because an agency or a state receives government funding means that they have to divulge. Now, the Supreme Court has ruled that a private organization that is established for the sole purpose of carrying out government research contracts and is totally funded by the federal government is not automatically an agency subject to the Freedom of Information Act. What this means is that the Smithsonian Institute They've voluntarily adopted disclosure policies very similar. So they will say to you, we have nothing to hide, right? You can get our information. You can come, make your request, and we're going to make our, our documents available to you. So they're saying that while, you know, there's a need to protect certain financial and donor, donor data through exemptions, um, they've said that we will presume that we need to disclose, right? And they have actually assumed many other provisions in the law. Now, agencies not covered again, the Congress, federal courts, private corporations are federally funded state agencies. This means the US Court District, the US Circuit Court of Appeals, and the US Supreme Court. Because military court systems was also created through the Department of Defense, they're also not covered. And of course, the regulations, and of course, not by the US Constitution, military branches often argue that the Freedom of Information applies to military court records including court dockets, which can render access to those records very difficult, given the delays that accompany most freedom of information requests, all right? So they are not there. Um, court documents are public because of a First Amendment right based on access. And of course, while the Federal Reserve Board of Governors is covered by the Freedom of Information Act, the 12 regional banks of the Federal Reserve are not considered government agencies. And so Freedom of Information Act does not apply to them. I'll go that back again. Even though the Federal Reserve Board of Governors in Washington is covered, the Federal Reserve Board is covered, the 12 regional banks of the Federal Reserve are not covered. So the 12 regional banks, they have absolutely, absolutely all right to not <laughs> submit to a request for information that is actually coming from anyone who's seeking to investigate their um, activities. All right. Records held by regional banks, like many of those recently sought in connection with the government's private sector financial bailout packages, they're not subject to Freedom of Information Act unless also filed with Washington's Federal Reserve Board. And here's an image here. All right. And these agencies are not covered. So regional banks, they are not mandated under the Freedom of Information Act to actually give public information. Who can file a request? Come to this particular section. All US citizens can file a request as well as foreign nationals under the Freedom of Information Act. Corporations, partnerships, or other entities, such as a public interest group or a news organization, can actually file a Freedom of Information request. Note, however, that members of the news media have no or more fewer rights to information under the Freedom of Information Act other than the requesters. And like I said before, this whole notion that a journalist has this whole autonomy over every bit and piece of information, the public also has a right to know over and above and ahead and at the same level, at the same level, like I said, with those persons who are part of the media fraternity, all right? So what the news media will do, they will break the information first. And in some cases, the public will be stimulated to go dig deeper. Or in some cases, you may find a member of the public breaking the information to the media, and that gives the media some sort of, I would say, food or energy to go even deeper to ask for more information. So in some cases, the public and the media, they're working together to build the agenda for these particular types of requests, all right? Although the law gives journalists some rights to be benefits and expedited processing, especially if they were to say that this is within the public interest and of course, the right to know as a society what is actually happening. Who can file a request? You can write along. You've got the first right to obtain the document through internal or informal means. 
If it is that the document is available online, it's a waste of time and resources to actually go make a formal written request when it's actually there up in the public domain on the official website of that particular entity. Now, the government may agree to supply all or part of them on the spot, assuming that you know with reasonable specificity which records you want and which agency has them. Then you move right along and you call the public information person if you cannot obtain it by informal means. This is the next step, right? This is when you go and you make direct contact, you let them know who you are as a news reporter, researcher, scholar, and you're actually asking for the information. Now, um, is it useful or necessary? If it's turned down, seek the agency's officer if you're turned down. And of course, if it's necessary, use your right to make a formal freedom of information request as leverage in your efforts. Remember that only a written request, not an informal oral request, will place the agency on their legal duty to actually act, all right? If you've called someone and you've made a request, then you cannot necessarily say, well, I made a request about two months ago and I haven't heard. The question will be, how did you make the request? Did you make a formal written request? Then we don't have you on record and then you have no case in this particular situation, all right? Some exemptions like sunshine laws, there are some exemptions to the information you want to request. If the information you're seeking falls under one of the following areas, then your request will be clearly denied. And these include information that is classified to protect national security. Unless it's declassified, then you cannot necessarily be calling the agency or even writing, all right? Exemption number two, information related solely to the internal personal rules and practices of an agency. If it's a very highly classified particular operation and the agency's rules, again, are, you know, only for the internal people, then you cannot, you know, if it's an agency that has to do with central intelligence, for instance, um, why, why do you want to know how they get their clearances and stuff like that? This is not for the public interest. And then the third exemption, information that is prohibited from disclosure by another federal law. And of course, exemption four, trade secrets or commercial or financial information that is confidential are considered to be privileged. Exemption number five, privileged communications within or between agencies, including those protected by the deliberative process privilege, 25 years, attorney work product privilege, and of course, attorney client privilege. This has to do with those contracts that are signed between agencies when it comes to their whole legal um, arrangements or obligation in terms of the product and locking the product in and stuff like that and the information that the client um, has revealed to the attorney, all right? Exemption six, information that if disclosed would invade another individual's personal privacy. And exemption seven, information compiled for law enforcement purposes that will look like this could reasonably be expected to interfere with enforcement proceedings, would deprive a person of a right to a fair trial or an impartial adjudication. The next thing, could reasonably be expected to constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. Do you see how often invasion of privacy is coming up? The courts are very, very, very serious about that, right? Invasion of privacy. Later on, we're gonna talk about privacy laws. And then of course, could reasonably be expected to disclose the identity of a confidential source. And this might be issues around national security, maybe an operative, all right? A mole, somebody that the law enforcement um, is actually dealing with to divulge a case, maybe a person of interest, but it may not necessarily be a person of interest. So these are some exemptions that we ought to take note of in the context of information compiled for law enforcement purposes that you cannot necessarily be asking <laughs> for details on or information, all right? Now, moving right along, number E, if the information you're seeking would disclose techniques and procedures for law enforcement investigations or prosecutions, or would disclose guidelines for law enforcement investigations or prosecutions, if such disclosure could reasonably be expected to risk circumvention of the law, you cannot expect to have this information. And of course, if it could reasonably be expected to endanger the life or physical safety of an individual. So these are exemptions to the information you can ask for. And then of course, we've got a couple others here, information that concerns the supervision of financial institutions and geological information on oil wells, oil that runs the world, that rules industry, right? You're never going to get this type of information. 
for security purposes. Now, like the government in the Sunshine Act, the Freedom of Information Act is a federal law and it does not apply to local governments and agencies. If we need information, I say we, if you need and if I need information from a local agency, what we need to do is to make a request on the local open records laws. So make sure you are aware of and you access the Georgia Open Records laws, the Georgia Open Records Act, so that you are aware of what you can and cannot actually request under the particular law. Now, for the Georgia Open Records Act, all departments or agencies or boards of the state or counties or municipalities in the state of Georgia will be covered under that. And of course, nonprofits that receive at least one third of their funding from the government, they would definitely be covered under the Georgia Open Records Act. All right, I'll repeat that. All departments, agencies, boards, uh, of course, as they fall under the state or counties or municipalities in the state of Georgia, they're all subject to the Georgia Open Records Act, as well as nonprofits that receive one third of their funding from the government, right? To receive government funding, we need to know exactly what you're doing. And so there needs to be some level of transparency with access to information. Now, the Open Records Act of Georgia really lags behind the Freedom of Information Act in terms of where exemptions are. And of course, when it comes to confidential documents and all of these things that are listed here, there is need for a lot of reform in, in, in this particular scenario, all right? And of course, for a full list of exemptions, you can click on this link and it will lead you right there to where you're supposed to be going um, with relation to the Georgia Open Records Act. Now, there's some readings that I'd like for you to access. The Department of Justice Guide to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, the Georgia Freedom of Information Laws, and of course, Judicial Watch versus Department of Defense. Some recommended reading would be the FCC Backstown, which uses emails related to Ajit Pais, Harlem Shake video. And of course, you don't need to necessarily look at this <coughs> sample here or to even think about the sample purely because you're not required to actually make a request or to actually hear the Freedom of Information open records request for any purpose for this class. But in the event that you need to do so, just bear in mind what I've shared with you today in the context of what can and cannot actually be requested for and where you can actually go for those particular bits and pieces of information. So it's been a quite, you know, it's, it's been a good law um, in, in a context of what we can and cannot request, journalistic privilege and access. I know this has been quite a week for you with two huge lectures. And so I'd like you to take some time and to ruminate on the lectures before we go to the next module and to make your notes as we prepare for the middle of the semester, the, I would say the mid-semester test. Not every bit of the, um, I would say, lecture, not every aspect or every nitty gritty will come for the test, but it just really helps for you to think about and associate those particular issues with the cases and the legal aspects of this particular course that we're doing called Communication Law, Ethics and Diversity. If you have any questions or concerns about the content, about the volume of work, please feel free to email me directly or to come see me during my office hours, I'll be happy to facilitate um, at any time. Tuesday, Thursday, 10 to 12 o'clock. And so I'm going to leave you right here for now. Again, just email me, um, drop me a line, let me know how you're doing with the course so far. And if you find lectures to be useful, even as I upload my lectures on D2L along with my slides. So thank you for your time. <laughs>